there's basically almost no certified organic honey production in the United States because of the lack of large tracts of land yeah. which would be approved for that. Right. There's lots of beekeepers practicing organic beekeeping, but their product they their can't product, they sell can't as organic. Okay. So, yeah, um, almost everywhere that there's agriculture, and even where there's not agriculture, where there's even just public lands, um, or private lands, people are using chemicals everywhere. It's hard to avoid it. Yeah. I mean, I would like to put my all my bees in those types of places, um, and I'd love to be certified organic. It's just those large tracts of land around here are up in the mountains, and even the Forest Service who's managing those are using pesticides. Right. So there's only a few places that they've been able to pull off organic honey production in the United States. Hawaii was one of them. Um, I heard of some organic honey coming out of Idaho at one point. Um, definitely the possibility exists. Um, it's just, it's not very common because agriculture is everywhere and even where agriculture isn't, pesticide use and herbicide use is very heavily promoted. Right. How um, much space do you think you need? To be certified you need three, um, a three mile radius um, fly zone. So basically if you had it in a square block that'd be nine square miles. Um, and your bees would have to be right in the center. <clears throat> So, yeah, it doesn't exist around here, um, which is unfortunate because we have some of the most pristine wild areas in the country and um, great honey, it's a great honey producing area. Um, you know, I dream of the day where I could be certified organic in Montana. Um, not only would that mean a huge increase in what I could sell my honey for, but it just it's just a peace of mind knowing that what I'm eating doesn't have glyphosate in it. Um, and that's that's a big it's a big problem. I mean even they found Roundup in or glyphosate glyphosate um, and uh, organic honeys that come from other countries. And so you wonder, oh, am I actually getting an organic right. product here? Yeah. It's hard to know. Honey is the hardest thing to do because you can't control the honeybees. Control it's not like yeah, other... Yeah. yeah. I mean, they fly a mile to two normally and they can go further. So that's why they have the three mile thing, not to say they couldn't go past that. Um, so yeah. Alright, last little part was just tuning into nature's patterns, which we've all already kind of covered. But in this country, it's all about spring rainfall, um, the snow melt has a little bit of effect on how the rivers do, but uh, the rainfall is really what determines whether or not you're going to get a honey crop. Um, the heat, um, the daily temperatures, both high and low, have an effect on how well plants produce nectar and pollen. So if those aren't within the range that the plants are happy doing that at, like they're, it's too cold at night or too warm at night or too cold during the day or too hot, it, that all affects how much honey will be produced. So you start looking at long range forecasts, you start um, noticing how much it rained, you start um, noticing when things come on early um, and those little differences will have a huge effect on how successful you are managing your colony. Because if you just plan for, you know, oh, it's summer solstice, every year I do this, um, it's great, yeah, nature does kind of follow those patterns, but when you're depending on rainfall and daily temperatures, those things are always different. Um, so tuning into those, especially early in the spring, especially right now, um, will have a huge effect on how successful you are. If you make uh, a new hive in the spring thinking, oh, the honey flow is coming on, and, and that hive has very little reserves but is building up fast, you might have to feed in the spring um, just to keep it alive, just because you didn't give it enough stores to begin with. It's not a full-size colony with plenty of stores. Um, and let's say you had an unseasonably warm uh, spring or late winter, they might have built a lot of brood early and used up all the honey stores just because it was a 
um, warm spring, early spring. And so knowing how that stuff affects your honeybees will greatly improve your ability to care for them. Um, right now, whether or not it rained in the last two weeks might determine whether or not you're going to pull off any honey off your hive or you're going to start feeding now. Um, so we did get some rain recently which helped a lot considering it's such a dry spring but that dry spring has meant a very limited honey flow so it's not going to be a great year no matter what unless it rained two inches um, every week for the next two weeks and then we had another heat, heat wave we're not going to see a great crop and that's just kind of you know that's part of being in Montana it's yeah it's beautiful and everything but if there weren't mountains here, it'd be a desert. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, that's going to be a big part of, big part of, uh, learning about the bees and how in tune to nature they are. Because they're, um, they know before time. They know when something's coming two or three weeks down the road and they can prepare for it. They start building brood and putting all their honey stores and pollen stores to brood production they know what's coming. They know when a storm is coming in the next 24 to 80, 48 hours and they um, appropriately, you know, prepare for that. They're always more aggressive when the storm's coming because they don't want to be messed with when it's going to start raining and there's more bees at home. So it's, um, you know, noticing that will help you, you know, not only be a, bee, a better beekeeper but know when to get into the bees. Um, yeah, do you have any more questions about, about that? Yeah, well you can learn that without ever opening a hive. Just by watching the roadsides and the fields and you know where things are blooming and seeing what plants are blooming at what time and then going back and standing in front of the hive and seeing how much they're flying, how much pollen's coming in, that sort of thing. And uh, yeah, I learned it all just from driving from bee yard to bee yard to bee yard, watching the side of the road and seeing all the different plants that come into bloom. And then, it I mean, it does take years, but a good yeah. beekeeper will anticipate things or they'll see things in nature and know what's gonna happen two to three weeks down the road and know what they have to start preparing for. And that, I mean, that does take years, but it's a skill that beekeepers have because they are so dependent on the weather and the bloom cycles and how things evolve through the season. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the fun part, I feel, like kind of trying to understand nature and trying to watch her patterns and um, learning from it and, and uh, anticipating, you know, it's... It's uh, a lot of guesswork. There's a lot of guesswork in beekeeping. You're always learning something. Like you're never ever gonna just be like, oh, I'm, you know, oh, this is just the typical thing. This is how it's always been. You know, it's easy to think like that, but um, even the old beekeepers, they're still like in amazement of what they learn from the bees. Something new, something different, like, um, they're so complex and mysterious and they have such intricate interactions between themselves and with nature that there's always something yeah. something to learn about um, but that's that's why people love them so much I mean they're just mysterious creatures that kind of just fascinate us and you know they will continue to fascinate <laughs> us and inspire us I mean so many things um, that we find in our society, in like human culture, were taken from patterns or or things seen in honeybee colonies. I mean, there's so many different parallels we can draw. Um, but they're a great teacher. They're one of nature's teachers. I like to consider weeds uh, one of nature's teachers because they can teach us so much about the soil and the um, climate and geography and bees are the same way but they can teach us more about society and interactions and um, work ethics. <laughs>
<laughs> they they do a lot um, for us, not just to um, you know provide us with food and pollination. They provide us with enjoyment, entertainment, and yeah, all sorts of wonder wonderment that he you know it's com it's coming from nature. But bees are just they're so they're such a poster child for um, what nature can produce. It's amazing what they produce. It's amazing all the medicinal and health benefits that can come from a colony of honeybees um, for themselves or for humans or any anything. Um, so, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm still constantly enamored and I'm inspired to teach classes and teach people about bees and talk about it because they, you know, they amaze me and like it's it's just uh, a great example from nature on how we can all prosper from listening to nature and working with it instead of considering ourselves separate from it but uh, learning how we're dependent on it what we can do to make things easier for the natural around, environment around us as well as for us personally yeah, I should probably stop talking. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, you talk about the frequency of opening the hive over mm. the course of the oh, season. Yeah. How little can you get away with that? <laughs> like just extracting honey? <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, my goal is to basically get into the hives only two or three times a year. And that's based on the assumption that eventually I'll have enough strong colonies that in the spring, all I go and do is harvest the surplus and make my new hives out of my strong hives and then um, come back, you know, a couple, you know, weeks or a month later, um, give them more room that they need for the summer months. Maybe I'll have to go back one more time um, to check, you know, make sure everything is going well. But if I'm going to be harvesting in the um, spring, I don't really need to do much in the fall as long as they're going into the summer with, you know, a healthy queen and enough room for storage and enough honey that they'll make it through um, the season, then I can kind of just forget about it. Right now, um, I go into the bees quite a bit more often because I am trying to build my numbers up. I'm doing a lot of management to make sure all my queens are um, doing well and I'm making a lot of new hives more hives than I have established strong colonies and since I'm in a breeding program where I'm um, trying to select the best um, bees based on my treatment free hives that are doing well um, you know I don't have a ton of them but it takes three or four or five years to kind of convert from a conventional operation to our organic treatment free operation and so that time there's there's more work to do but once you're there you know you don't really have to open them that much you can do a lot from just standing um, in front of the hive and seeing how they're doing or weighing the hive like not even open it but is it heavy is it completely full I can't even pick it up and there's bees hanging out the front like there's too many bees in the hive maybe I have to give it more room but uh, you know it, it's it's what you make of it basically if you're a good beekeeper it doesn't mean you're in the hive every week it means you are in the hive the least amount possible but you can recognize signs from nature or from the bees themselves that this has to happen like this is an incredible year they're gonna use or need twice the space they uh, usually have for honey storage so I'm gonna go and make that appropriate um, thing. Uh, as, a, as a beginning beekeeper I recommend people go into the hive probably at least once a month through um, de well depending on where you live but around here from April through September maybe once in October so that's one two three four five you know five or six times if you're doing all these sorts of treatments or feeding all these different substitutes you're gonna have to be in the hive a lot more and it's not uncommon 
uncommon for a commercial beekeeper to be in their hives twice a week or um, you know one or every one or two weeks when really like that's a lot of management if you're really good at what you do and you're efficient and uh, you don't have to do all these extra unnecessary things if you're doing organic beekeeping you start paring it down like oh I you know I was just there a month ago I put on two deep boxes on all the strong colonies like if they can fill that up and be re fill up the rest of the hive with honey they'll be ready for winter and I can just go back in the spring and take what they don't need if they don't need any so it it kind of depends on where you're at and your knowledge of beekeeping and um, your philosophy if you you have like five hives in your backyard and they're, it's your favorite thing to do, you're probably going to want to open them up more than once a month. Um, Can you open them up too much? Yeah. Like every time you open them, you kind of stress them out, yeah. especially the more invasive procedures that you do. Um, also, they've kind of conditioned the air inside the hive with the propolis and, um, you know, they keep the core temperature up. So if you open them up a lot, um, you're exposing them to potential infections and you're making them having to generate extra heat. So you're opening them up a lot in the winter, that's obviously a bad idea. I try to put them to bed in the fall, in October, November, um, and then not open them till April. If it's really early, early uh, spring like this year, like maybe March. But I'm hands off bees in the winter and in northern climates, it's, you know, in the southern part of the states, it's probably a little more friendly to be working bees or necessary to work them in the winter. Why, why would you need to open them in the winter? Here? Yeah. It, yeah, if, if they went in light um, and you knew that and you... See if they had enough food. Yeah, and you wanted to check to make sure they had enough food. Does that answer the question pretty well? Wonderful. Cool. What time is it? Quarter to twelve. Okay. Well, you guys want to oh, get into a hive? Yeah. Did you guys suit up at all last yeah, time? Yeah. Yeah. We've got extra gear if you guys both want to get suited up today, or one of you, or whatever, or if neither of you. She needs to do it. <laughs> I have a got... broken wrist. Oh, oh no. Um, I have a jacket that I just recently got. It's just a jacket with a veil. 